Welcome back. You're watching On Record with Professor Nirmalya Kumar, author and professor at the London Business School. You know, uh, in your book, Nirmalya, you've uh, spoken about two aspects of innovation, the invisible innovation, the visible innovation. The visible innovation is what we know as the nano, the cheap tablet, you know, the, the laptop, which is uh, uh, for the masses, etc., where costs are a factor. Take us through this division of invisible and visible. And when does this invisible become visible, if at all? So most of the books are on visible innovation, you know, which is the nanos, as you said, which is the cheap tablets, which are at a very low uh, price for the budget constrained consumer. You know, that's a lot of visible innovation that you see in India. India truly has a unique capability in frugal engineering, it seems, and in developing these low cost products. But what has really become big from India in the innovation space in the developed world is the invisible innovation. This is innovation being done in India, consumed by developed consumer, co developed country consumers. But because it's not branded India inside, you don't know that it is developed in India. So if I'm consuming a, a new airplane, right? That airplane has been developed in four or five different countries, one of which is India, where a few subsystems have been developed. So we call that invisible innovation. Now you're to the second part of your question, when did these invisible innovations become visible innovation? So one of the four kinds of invisible innovations we talk about is called process innovation. This is not a new product, but it's a new way of doing something. So let us take this example of call centers. Only in India do millions of smart, ambitious, young, educated people dream of working in a call center. Nowhere else in the world do they dream of working in a call center, at least not in the developed world, because the call center job is considered a dead-end job, right? So you get high school and high school dropouts for that job. In India, we get really smart, educated, ambitious people for the call center job. Well, when these smart, ambitious people take on a call center job, which is a very low skill, low, uh, you know, innovation job, what do they do? Well, they work on it for two or three months, the way the company tells them. Very quickly, they realize, I'm getting bored. And what you have done is you have put an injection of intelligence, as we term it, we use the term injection of intelligence, into a dead-end task. When you have this injection of intelligence, people quickly get bored, and then they tell their boss, listen, let me tell you how to do this job in a better way. And they come up with several process innovations on how to do the call center job better, how to redesign the process. Sure. And out of that, at some stage, you are starting to see companies in call centers come up with new products and services which they sell to the customers and say, listen, these are, you know, instead of doing the job this way, instead of telling, selling you more calls that we can take for you, let us sell you a software which will allow you not to have so many calls, which will allow quick intervention of calls, which will allow you to see a person on a website and say, maybe they need an outbound call instead of waiting for the call to come in, which you will then pay us to answer. So you are starting to see a suite of products come out of these call center companies, which are basically because of this ph ph phenomena that we call an injection of intelligence, putting overqualified people onto jobs. In no other part of the world would you see PhDs and highly technically trained people working in call centers, for example. You Know? And so they start innovating right, and they come up right. with products and services. There's a lot about the job market in India as well, Nirmalya. But uh, my question to you is that it's no longer something nice to do. Innovation is uh, essential for any business. And pretty much all Indian companies are also realizing that because suddenly they have increased focus on R&D, increased spends out there. How do you see the Indian companies uh, cashing in on this uh, the, this potential of India as an innovation hub. Indian R&D expenditure on innovation is 0.6% of GDP compared to China 1.2, compared to the developed world where it's 2.5 plus percent of GDP spent on R&D. So India's expenditure on R&D is very mm. small for the moment, which is to be expected in a poor country. Now for Indian corporates, because the market is growing so fast currently, the biggest challenge they face is selling and especially more than that, getting the production up and getting products you know, into some kind of quality standard and incremental innovation. So for most Indian companies at this stage of the life cycle of the economy, the country and their company, it's probably not financially viable to spend a huge amount of money on real product innovation because product innovation has a particular characteristics especially radical product innovation. You try 10 new products, maybe one succeeds which means the risk return reward uh, risk return is such that you have sure. to be willing to fund 10 nine losers for every one winner given that in india i already have such a growing market it's better for me to try to concentrate on what i'm already doing well for which the market is growing 15 20 percent a year rather than try to go for new products for which i'm going to face face a very high failure rate 
But somewhere down the line, innovation and uh, the ability to innovate is going to be key because you know a lot of corporates talk about that they uh, have created new verticals because of the innovation and the bottom-up approach that we've got, like Swatch, etc., where you know the Tatas have put in money. My question to you is that when innovation does happen and becomes essential, is the big challenge going to be to scale it up, to take it to market? Because those are the two things that Indian companies are just getting the hang of, especially in new innovative products. Personally, for me. If there's one thing Indian companies are strong at, they're strong at marketing. You see that Indian advertising wins adver uh, advertising awards all the time. Indian marketing is very creative, both in terms of advertising, in terms of outdoor, in terms of uh, what they do with the bottom of the pyramid. So I don't really feel that if there's one capability Indian companies lack, it's marketing. The capability they probably lack is R&D and new product development. So if they get the new product and R&D capability correct, I think marketing and launching those products and uh, this thing, you don't see a lot of stories of Indian companies having developed great new products which they have not been able to sell. You know, in France, I hear a lot of that. In Japan, I hear some of that. In America, I may hear that, but I don't hear that in India. In India, it's more about getting the new product machine, developed machine going. And when Indian corporates decide they want to get into new product development, this story, I suspect, is going to be pretty much like it was in 1991 when Indian family business decided to professionalize. When they decided to professionalize, what did they do? They went to the Hindustan Levers and the other subsidiaries of multinational companies and raided the managers out of there and brought them into their companies to say, tell us how it is being done in the multinational subsidiaries and professionalize our family businesses. When Indian corporates decide to go for R&D and innovation as a core pillar of their strategy. What are they going to do? They're going to raid all these captive firms and these IT companies and hire people out of there and say, listen, come and set up a product development engine in our company, just as there is one in Microsoft and there's one in Intel and there's one in AstraZeneca where you have worked in the Indian captives. So I think that there's another positive spillover of this effect which will come in the future. Again, because Absolutely. my book is not about best Absolutely. practice Absolutely. Is that today. already happening? How far away is that? Uh, I suspect it's a decade away. It's a decade in the making, you know, because again, my book is not about best practice today. It is some of that, but a lot of it is about next practice. It's about what is coming. So I'm saying India is starting to show the signs of a global innovation hub. Already it's an unavoidable destination for multinational firms doing innovation. And in the next 10 years, this can really blow up and become huge. We have to scale up the education sector from primary to PhD not by 10% or 5%, but by a factor of double, triple, quadruple.